five R fifty five E, and uh, it's a five speed transmission. This particular one here, and uh, can somebody tell me, point out the pump? Somebody point out the pump. Where's short version? Okay, so basically what you got right here is you've got this thing right here, this torque converter, and then what is this part right here? It's going to be, well, that's not a bad answer, but the correct name for that is turbine shaft. Okay, uh, you call it a turbine shaft because you see this red part right here? This red part right here turns out to be the turbine. The turbine Whenever this is spinning, when the engine is spinning this part of the torque converter, see how it's bolted to the flywheel, so here's your bolt for the flywheel. When it's spinning that, this doesn't necessarily have to be moving. It can be stationary. However, you might notice because of the way this is made, this will be spinning, and that is the pump. That is a Geroder style pump. Okay, so that pump is basically going to pick your fluid up out of your pan and it's going to put pressure everywhere the pressure needs to be in order to make all this stuff work. But, start with a torque converter, and you're going to see more on torque converters as we go, because there's a, in your elect tube, there is a uh, segment on torque converters, and, and I've got a really good one, too, that I can show you this video thing. Uh, but basically, think of this right here. If I had two fans, I got two fans facing each other, right? These electric fans we got out here that are sitting on these little stands. If I take one fan and I put it blowing through another fan, plug this one in, and I hook this one to some kind of load, I'm basically going to turn this fan on, and what's this other fan going to do? It's going to start spinning, isn't it? So that's what a torque converter basically is. You've got the, the impeller is built into the um, shell of the torque converter. And I've got a torque converter over there that's cut apart that I'm going to show you guys too. Okay. That is actually going to be throwing fluid against the impeller. And so that fluid is being thrown against the impeller. It's like a big centrifuge is what it is. And as that impeller is trying to move, right here, you see this part with this little one-way clutch in here, the, the blue part? That is the stator. Now, you might have noticed on an, on an automatic transmission, typically, on every automatic transmission that you see, you're going to see the turbine shaft coming out the front of the transmission. And around it, you're going to see, and it's got splines on it, right? Around it, you're going to see some more splines. So you've got a shaft coming out. The part, the outside part, doesn't move. It's stationary. You can't turn it even if you wanted to. So what that is, the stator support. The stator is on there. And what the stator does, look at there, I want to fix that now. What the stator does is it redirects uh, the fluid so you can get the maximum amount of help. In other words, the fluid is actually going to change direction so it's hitting the uh, turbine with a maximum amount of force. So it begins to turn that. As you, if this picks up speed, it overcomes this. When you got it in gear and this is locked, this is going out to your drive shaft. And see all these, see all these clutch packs and stuff in here? And bands and whatnot. Bands typically, there's band adjustments right there. Those bands are like a brake. And they're going to stop the outside of that. Every part of this is actually operating around these planetary gear sets. The planetary gear sets are what give you your different gear ratios. So you hold part of it, you drive part of it, part of it is, you know, driven. Uh, some, if it's like, for instance, if you hold the, the carrier, which has got the little planet gears on it, you're in reverse then. If you hold it and drive either the, ins either the sun gear or the ring gear, and like I say, you know, there's a planetary gear set thing in there too. What's this part right here? Uh, it's a sort of, but I mean, that, what's that gold colored part? Is it a shift solenoid? No, that's actually the uh, neutral safety switch. Yeah, what that is. And this right here is where your solenoid shift solenoids are down in the pan on this one or for a plug into. Now on these, uh, like that little Dodge we were talking about, that uh, Dodge Stratus, the uh, shift solenoids are on the outside of the transmission. And you can change them real easy. They don't cost all that much either. Uh, this right here is a speed sensor, and this is another speed sensor. All right, I like to turn the light off when we're looking at that. And this is actually, there is a turbine speed sensor, and there's an output shaft speed sensor. And some of them will have an actually an intermediate shaft speed sensor. Uh, but just look at that and kind of get used to it. Back here is when you put it in park, 
you got a little parking pole that locks into that dog back there. And so these right here have all got, you know, uh, fluid pistons that apply them. All right, now then, wait a minute. This one here, what we got, this is how a front wheel drive transaxle put together. These, extra, these right here are going out to either one of your wheels. And you got all your clutches and stuff in here. You notice it's stacked together pretty much the same way in here. But the torque converter is driving a turbine shaft, which is spin, pulling a chain, and that's how that's transmitted. Everybody understand that now? Now what is this thing right here? You got any idea? Anybody know? It's probably like a pressure regulator or something. Yeah, it's got, we got an accumulator. Like if you're going to feed that fluid up in there and apply those clutches, you're going to have an accumulator in there so that whenever the uh, fluid goes up in there, it'll actually squeeze a spring, that fluid pressure will, and it softens the application going to those uh, clutches. This right here is a differential. That enables you to go around curves and let this wheel turn faster than that one or let that one turn faster than this one, but it can drive it straight down the road. Whenever you're going straight down the road, these gears are whirling, but they're not interacting with one another as gears. They're actually just kind of locked together. All right. All right, now, every one of these has got a purpose. You know what happened here? <clears throat> this is the little separator plate in a valve body, and there's a ball that goes in there. And that ball shuttles back and forth between these two, depending on which way the fluid's going. And it's basically, that's one of the ways that these things direct fluid. The reason I took a picture of that is we were we built this uh, RE four hundred one transmission in a uh, uh, pickup truck that belonged to Judy McLaney. It was a uh, Nissan hard body, and when we got it all built up, uh, what happens is, and let me tell you about this: the turbine shaft where it goes into the torque converter sometimes will strip out, and when it strips out, you've got tons and tons of metal filings that are going to go into the transmission cooler. So let's say you put a torque converter in it, you clean the transmission out really good, you clean the valve body, you get it all put back together, everything's like it's supposed to be, uh, but you didn't think about flushing out the torque converter or those lines, and what happens is all of that metal goes into the doggone uh, transmission and it stops up, I mean it causes valves to stick in the valve body. And these guys had to take the valve body off this thing about five or six times to clean it. And it's a real complicated valve body on that one. And they got in a hurry. And so what they did was, instead of just putting one ball there, see so how the shuttles back and forth, you can see the track. I got that valve body, that, that slipper plate laid up there somewhere. Um, they put two balls in there. And what happened, because they put two balls in there, the way everything's piped, when it shifted to second gear the first time when they drove it, it locked the back wheels up. Because it was in two gears. You know, so this is, a, every little thing's got to be just right when you do that. And those torque, whenever you're putting a valve body back on one, to begin with, you don't take every single bolt out of the valve body you can see to get the valve body off, right? Usually they'll be a bunch of smaller bolts, then there'll be a bigger bolts to hold the valve body on. You take the valve body off as a unit, but don't just take every bolt out pell-mell. And whenever, and when you're taking the bolts out, make sure that you pay attention to the length of them, because they're going to be various different lengths. And uh, the best transmission books will have an exploded view so you can go back together with it looking at that. Okay, so you lay your valve body over here aside, still assembled. You're going to take it apart separately, lay all the valves and springs out, keep them in order, and put it back together the right way. All right. Now this right here is a solenoid, transmission solenoid. It's a connector that marries the vehicle wire harness to the solenoids inside the transmission. This came from a police car from the out police department. And they were having all kinds of problems. They kept throwing codes for one of the particular solenoids. I don't remember which one it was. And this part right here turned out to be the problem. You see this all burnt and scorched down here? An electrical problem can cause issues with automatic transmission nowadays. And that's pretty much what happened with that one there. That's just a little quickie. All right, what is this right here? You see that part back here he's pointing at? I think it's Adam Snap's finger, by the way. It's a fire. That is actually a one-way clutch, a little sprag clutch, but actually it's not a sprag, it's actually a roller clutch, but it works just like a sprag. A sprag has got a bunch of little bow tie shaped things in there that do the same job. But these little ramps right here, if you look really close, you can see these little ramps right here. See that little ramp? And when that ball rolls up that ramp, 
it basically is going to stop that thing from turning back that way. When it's turning this way, it turns just fine, but when it tries to turn the other way, it can't. And that's one of the kind of questions that you're going to find in automatic transmission. And uh, if somebody, for instance, and this isn't something a lot of people don't know, if you've got like our old mobile out here, and you jack it up on the left and you drive it on the left and you go faster than about 45 miles an hour, you run the risk, see a little accordion looking springs, they're hard to see right there, but you take the temper out of those springs so that, so that they're not holding those things up in the release position, you'll wind up having a, like a, I've seen these old mobiles where somebody drove them too fast on the lift, took the temper out of those springs, and then it's sitting here when you, you know, it may have your knee against the tire while it's idling and it's constantly trying to catch and go, even though it's not in gear. Yeah, mind you put it in neutral, control, yeah. rev it up, and it tries to pull. Yeah, yeah, you've got some, you got some stuff pushing. All right, now this right here is an exploded view that you're typically going to use when you're putting a transmission back together. That doesn't really look like it's all that complicated, does it? Nobody said anything. What do you think? See the pump? Why do they call that a front pump? There's no rear pump. Not only they haven't been a rear pump for many, many, many years. They used to have a rear and front pump. See, look here, you got front pump, coast clutch, overdrive planetary, overdrive clutch, intermediate clutch, direct clutch, forward clutch, forward planetary, reverse clutch is planetary. Okay, and then you got a, in the back of it, you got one of your one way clutches down there. Now, quick shaft, extension housing. Get a, get a picture of that. If you're watching a transmission mechanic at a transmission rebuild shop, to begin with, his bench is going to be spotless clean. It will have not a speck of dirt anywhere. It's going to be look like you could eat off of it and feel like you wouldn't get a germ. I mean, it's going to be perfectly clean. All right. Secondly, he's usually going to have something like this laying there. And he's going to, when you pull the parts out, you lay them out in the order you pull them out. Now, the annoying thing about this sometimes, whenever you're looking at it, if you're just trying to wing it and pull it apart and see how it comes apart, sometimes it's hard to figure out how this next part comes out. Right? You ever you run into that? You know, but I mean, you if you've got the literature to look at it. This thing right here is grown so it's anatomically correct, so that it shows you every snap ring and everything. And you'll see little bearing like things inside some of these drums that you need to be looking at real close too. We'll talk about that a little bit I later. Watch a YouTube video on how to get my front yeah. <laughs> ring Having a smartphone and YouTube is really helpful, you know, whenever you're doing that. Uh, that right there was a transmission at the Ford Training Center. Uh, that was a uh, I think that's a 4R44E, I think, and that's a 5R55E, like the one that we just looked at the cutaway from. And uh, see, it's out, see how it's mounted on that bench and it's upside down and the valve body's up and all that? Now, when you're tearing a transmission apart, the first thing you're going to do, a lot of people when they start tearing a transmission apart, they'll have it sitting with a pan on it and they'll take the pump out first, and that's the wrong way to do that. You turn the thing over on its back, you take the pan off, you lay the pan over here so you can put bolts and stuff in it. And you start pulling it apart and putting them pieces in it. When you get the valve body off and completely out of your way to get it all stripped down, that's when you start pulling the pump and the other parts coming out of it. You got me? All right. I like to turn them off because it's a little bit better picture. This is just a little hodgepodge of pictures. This right here is an AOD. It's an automatic overdrive transmission. And it works in a peculiar fashion. It's got a third little shaft going up in there. It's locked up in the front of the uh, converter. And overdrive, you understand what the difference between overdrive is and a regular gear? If you got a, you can have a four speed transmission with overdrive, uh, and then you got torque converter lockup. So basically, torque converter lockup makes it a straight lockup all the way from the engine all the way through the drive shaft, right? That's in your high gear. That's in your third gear, like on this one here. Fourth gear basically has your drive shaft turning faster than your engine, and they do that for gas mileage. So always remember that in an overdrive range, your drive shaft is turning faster than your engine. That's what overdrive is all about, and it's all about gas mileage. They had overdrive transmissions back in the 1960s, and probably before that. And some of them would be, maybe a column shift. How many ever drove one with three on the tree? Three on the tree. You pull it first, second, third. Well, this one guy that I heard about up there in North Alabama back in the 1960s was driving a 67 Chevelle that he bought. And he was just having a whoopee good time on a Friday night. And he was going up and down through that valley up there just, and the cops couldn't catch him. And whenever they would be over there, they were afraid to set up a roadblock, afraid he'd run into him and kill somebody. And no, they just, he was just too fast for him. So this guy came out with this 63 Biscayne police interceptor, this old sheriff. And he gets after that guy. 
and the guy that's driving the car has got that Chevelle wound up as fast as it will go. Well, this guy's got overdrive, three on the tree with overdrive, which is six forward gears. And what you do is you put it in forward gear, you take off, you let off, and a little dog comes out and locks the planetary, and you got another range. And then it unlocks when you go to your second gear, and you go and you let off, and it locks again. That was a, you know, kind of complicated. If you didn't want overdrive, you pull a little thing out. Well, he was whacked, he was wiped out as far as he could go. And this, he says, whenever I looked over there and that sheriff came around me, he said, I don't know how fast I was going, my speedometer had already tacked out, but I saw him reach down and pull it down in high. <laughs> the old sheriff had two years left to go on that overdrive transmission, high speed rear end. Like but that's what overdrive is about, is for speed and fuel economies. And that's a true story. But um, anyway, that right there is a transaxle that was in the uh, tempos and Topaz and the Escorts in the early days. Now it's slightly different from the transaxle we've got out. Well, ours have got manual on it. But that right there is an ATX, they call it. And you can kind of see how they stack all that stuff in there real compact. The pump on this one is back here, and there's a rod that goes through the middle of it that drives the pump. It's really weird. But I rebuilt a bunch of those back in the day. And that's another shot of that. Now this guy right here, Jerry, uh, he was basically just going to service his transmission or something. I can't remember what he was doing. But he didn't clean everything up good before he put the uh, valve body back on it. Or I mean, before he put the, what the heck did he do? Somehow he got dirt in the transmission oil pan. And it kept sticking valves so that it wouldn't shift. And he pulled that thing off about six times before he got all of the valves cleaned or that mean everything out there. When that dirt gets up in there, those metal filings from that uh, transmission cooler that you didn't flush or replace, you know, it's best if you've got one that's got a bunch of metal filings in it from a torque converter to either replace the cooler or put a new radiator on it. You know, you put an external cooler on it and all that. Okay, that right there, you got to look for stuff like this. You might not notice that if you didn't have a sharp eye or you might. But see how that's all burnt? It's been hot. When you see stuff like that, that gear and everything associated with it's got to be replaced typically. Now we can actually run our fluid through there, or we're trying to see what's there, we can go through a paint strainer with it and, you know, actually put the radiator, I put this one radiator in the parts washer and I let the, went into the transmission cooler and I let it come out through a paint strainer and that's some of what came out of it. There was a lot more of that, you know. And this right here, when you pull a transmission oil pan off and it looks like that, it's pretty much over for that one. It's going to have to be built. And, uh, and then that right there is another transaxle. Um, and it's a, it's obviously not a microphone. I don't remember which one that is, but it is. Uh, I'm afraid to lie to you and tell you what that was. And there's another one right there too. We started over. Okay, now then. Okay, I'm gonna give you some uh, run through some stuff here, and we're gonna give you a little bit of something here to chew on. All right, I want you guys to answer this as you can. Um, if think about it, when you say, what happens? when a holding clutch is applied. What would you think would happen when a holding clutch is applied? Now remember, a holding clutch and a band are very similar to each other, right? You've seen a band, did yours have bands? You didn't have no bands, you had holding clutches, didn't you? Yeah. How, what's the difference between a holding clutch and a regular clutch? Now, one's like a piece of metal. You got vinyl, vinyl's like you had a fiber and a steel, a fiber and a steel, a fiber and a steel. The fibers have got teeth on the inside, the steels have got teeth on the outside. And you can have those either uh, where the steels are going into the outside of the case and the fibers are going to the drum that it's supposed to hold. When you apply one of those, it stops that part. That's a break, is what it is. A gear set element is held and power flow is redirected. That's the right answer to that. Remember this because if I give you a pop test, you're going to have to have these answers, right? Uh, what do the hydraulic clutches and bands do? A, hold and drive planetary gear sets. B, produce various output ranges of torque and speed. C, provide fluid reservoir and hydraulic passages. They hold and drive planetary gear set. The planetary gear set is the part of the transmission that gives you your different gear. Can't, right. can't you just bands to make it shift different? Yeah, you well, the band adjustment's pretty important, uh, but I wouldn't do that and make a shift difference. Basically, when you're going to get with a shift difference, you're going to change some of your springs and drill some holes out bigger and 
make an accumulator, you know, put accumulator springs that are different so it'll shift firmer. And a firm shift is better for the clutch than one that's a soft shift. And I will tell you what some of these transmissions do. They're set up so that the PCM detorques the engine at the moment of shift so that you barely feel it. So there's more going on there than what you think. But yeah, you can you can change some things by adjusting your band, but it's not anything to play with. The transmission fluid pump is usually driven by what? Torque converter hub. When you go, you put a torque converter back in, who's done that in here? Who's put a torque converter back in? All right, and when you put a torque converter back in, what do you got to do? How does, what's the right way to do it? Transmission's on the thing, you got to put the torque converter back in, what you got to do? Lock it back and forth. I grab that button and I spin it and I want to hear it go clunk, clunk, clunk. I want to hear it go all the way in. If it just goes clunk, clunk, and it was supposed to go clunk, 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 and you start trying to put it in there and it binds up and then you pinch it together, the next thing you may have take it apart and find it, you busted your transmission pump or something. So make darn sure that turn converter is all the way back in. I put that one in the van mm -hmm. last semester. Yep. I put it in and it clicked three times, but when I was putting it up there and slid out one, yeah. I had to let it back down. So yep. Well, the fact that you caught that was very fortunate, really, and that was smart. What happens when fluid passes through a reduced opening? Pressure. Good point. Pressure increases. I mean, think about this. You're putting your thumb over the end of the water hose, the hose gets tight, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's flowing nice and smooth. The hose is kind of flat because, of, but when you put it over there, it gets tight. That's what the deal is. In a one-to-one -one gear ratio, the drive gear rotates Slower at the same speed as the gear it drives or faster? Same speed. Same speed. That's a one to one. Why does transmission fluid transfer movement? Why does any fluid transfer movement? Pressure. You cannot compress fluid. Now, fluid will expand and contract, but you can't compress it. That's why brakes work like they, as good as they do. You can't compress any fluid, but now some fluid expands and contracts. Transmission fluid expands and contracts. Motor oil doesn't, or it does in just such a small amount, it don't matter. Um, what is the role of the hydraulic valve in a valve body? What do you think? Directs fluid flow or controls fluid pressure? One of those two. All it is. Uh, what's the reduction from one to four ratio called? One to four. One turn to four turns, that's going to be overdrive, right? Of course, it ain't ever going to be that much. It'll be like 0.79 to one. That's usually what overdrive feels like. Clutches and bands are applied and released by what? What is it that directs the fluid to the clutches and bands to cause them to? The valve body. The torque converter basically is providing the turning for the transmission turbine shaft, and it also drives the pump and that kind of thing. Uh, what do the driving devices do? They transfer power from one component to another. This is being driven. This, I mean, in other words, this is driving the part of the gear that's actually where the power is going into the gear. Well, depending on which planetary gear set components are held or, you know, whatever is going to cause you to have the, uh, different gear ratios, that's what that's all about. Uh, which of these is the symptom of a faulty transmission fluid pump? If you got a bad pump, what are you going to have? What do you got to have before the transmission will move? You got to have fluid pressure, right? Yeah. It'll probably slip or it won't move at all. Won't move at all, that's a good answer. And I will tell you this, I'd like for everybody that drives a car here to do this is we're going to put you a transmission pressure gauge on your car and we're going to let you drive that thing for a day or so with that gauge on there so you can see what the pressure normally looks like. Right? Ain't that smart? Just drive it. When a sim what's a symptom of worn friction discs and a holding clutch? Slips. Slipping in a control gear. That's right. And I tell you what, there's not a lot of lining on there if it slips a little bit for some reason. Like here's another thing. You know a lot of these have got a, uh, they actually change the, the valve body pressure with throttle angle, right? Now it's done electronically on the newer ones, but on the older ones it was a cable. And it would actually increase the fluid pressure the deeper you went into the throttle. And that would work against governor pressure and it caused it to hold the gears longer, it would shift harder. But if somebody leaves that unhooked from the throttle body because they're being a little careless, that transmission will be burnt up before it gets halfway across town because you left that one little cable unhooked on the, if it's got a cable. Right? So be really, really careful in particular make sure you hook all that stuff back up because there's a lot more to it than that one little thing you see, right? What happens inside the torque converter at higher speeds? The turbine and the impeller spin at similar speeds. The turbine is the part that hooks to the transmission input shaft. The impeller is the part that's bolted to the engine. 
How does the torque converter lock up? The lock up torque converter on that one, but well, that other one I showed you, that automatic overdrive, it's got a permanent lockup. It's got a shaft spline into it, and it goes down in there, lockup down inside the transmission. That's kind of unusual. Usually, they have a clutch, and I got one over cut apart. It has got pressure that applies it and it touches the inside. It's got a line in on that clutch, and that clutch is actually, you know, causes the turbine shaft to be one with the engine all the way back. If it don't unlock, it'll stall too, like if something's going on like that. Um, how'd you uh, describe the torque and speed produced by a, wait a minute, the torque converter is best described as a fluid coupling that transmits power flow from the engine. You got that? Now this is liable to be on a verbal exam. I'm not going to ask you this one day out of the shop when you're just standing there. How would you best describe the torque converter? How would you describe the torque and speed of a 1 to 4 ratio? That's high speed, low torque. It's overdrive, right? Why do you want, why do you, what's this tow haul button that I have on the end of my Chevrolet? Why would you want to do that? Because the uh, overdrive clutches ain't as strong as the other clutches. You don't have as many in the part one. Well, you want to pull a trailer, you turn that off so that the truck won't be putting so much of a strain like you're talking about. A hydraulic piston is used to operate what? Most applied devices. If you've got a band that needs to be applied, you'll have a piston in there. It's got seals on it. Pressure will be pumped in behind it. There's a spring that causes it to return. You're going to see this stuff when you get over there. Uh, what do holding devices do? They prevent elements from turning. Got it? What happens when fluid passes through an enlarged opening? Decreases pressure. Decreases pressure. What I was telling Daniel, the small heater hose is the one coming from the engine. The big heater hose is the one going back to the engine. You come up backwards somehow, you're going to bust your heater core, right? So transmission fluid pump outlet port leads to where? The transmission fluid pump outlet port leads directly to where? Torque converter. It's pulling all out of the pan, putting it in the torque converter. It's got to go there first. Without oil in the torque converter, you got nothing, right? You got no converter pressure. You got no movement because the, tur the turbines it requires that fluid to be thrown against the impeller before it's going to turn it, right? Now the, the there is a stall speed worksheet in there. Stall speed is really important to understand. But what you do with stall speed, this sounds counterintuitive, you lock your brake, you stand on your brake as hard as you can, you put it in gear, and you hold the pedal to the floor. And you see where the tack stops, that's your stall speed. If the engine's underpowered, your stall speed will be low. If the stator overrunning clutch in the middle of that torque converter's bed, you'll have low stall speed. But first you've got to make sure you've got a good strong engine. Right? Got a good strong engine, low stall speed, got to find out what your stall speed's supposed to be. I've seen expeditions where it was 2,900, but most of them it's about 1,600, 1,700. But if the stall speed's low, like if it's 900 and it'll be 1,600, you probably got a bad torque converter. If the engine, unless the engine's underpowered or the converter's you know clogged or something like that. I mean torque, I mean uh, catalytic converter. What do you do? Stomp the brake as hard as you can. Hold the pedal on the floor and get the stomp brake. Well, you you ain't pushing. You ain't got enough brake pressure on. You got to lock the park brake. And you're going to have to use your big old man leg to just stand on it as hard as you can. And then you're going to have to put it in gear. And, you know, you got to go through. And you do that in every gear except neutral and park because you don't want to just rev it up for no reason in neutral and park. Reverse, the pressures are typically up. But you're looking at your pressures while you got it stalled. See what I mean? And if your stall speed, I've got some handouts for you. If your stall speed is not... Uh, now, I mean, in other words, if your pressure is screwed up during stall speed, it's going to lead you somewhere. The best thing you can do if you're going to work on a transmission is find out what those pressures are in every year and see if you can determine what's wrong as much as you can before you go in there. And then look at these little things about which bands and which clutches and all that and say, okay, I know with this problem, with this locked in and this gear, I'm probably going to have a problem in the intermediate clutch and you pay particular attention to the valve and the seals and the clutches in the intermediate clutch pack or whatever. You see what I'm saying? you got to track all that stuff down. Um, transaxle different from a transmission because the transaxle does what? Uses half shafts, right? CV axle. All right, I'm almost through here, so bear with me. We got lunch in just a minute. Um, how do transmissions and transaxles produce a range of torque needed for normal driving? Well, this is not complicated. They provide different gear combination, you know, whatever. Uh, what kind of transmission fluid pump uses a hub with retractable veins that slide along the inside of a movable bore ring? That's basically a variable displacement pump. You see those uh, typically more often on 
some of the transaxles like GM transmissions having them and stuff like that. And um, all right, now which of these is the pressure control?